Hello, everybody. And this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special author here today. It's Mary Tredu. And she is just an amazing individual. She writes children's books and she has a children's book that she just recently launched and it's beautiful. And she talks about how to keep the, the planet magical. And she's gonna tell you what she means by that. And she's just an amazing person with just an amazing concept about the environment, about children, about keeping the world a magical place to live in. And she's gonna tell you all about herself and everything else that we just mentioned. Mary, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm honored to have you you know, uh, speak today to, on our show. And, you know, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Well, great. Thank you for the opportunity, Stacey. I'm very excited to uh, to be here as well. Um, so, well, I'm I'm a mom and uh, they're they're adult. Uh, they're adults now, but, you know, I'm still a mom. Um, mm -hmm. And besides that, for for a career, I I'm an engineer. I'm a civil engineer. I specialize in uh, in water resources and. Uh, for a while, I managed uh, different parts of the water infrastructure, and then more recently, I've been a consultant for water environment policy and program and, and pollution prevention more broadly. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, we have a lot of environmental issues. And I was inspired to write a children's book, it's called A Tale of Two Planets, um, just because we really need to, um, I think, appreciate our planet and how magic it is, what it does for us without us thinking about it. And um, appreciation inspires uh, gratitude, which relieves um, stress. And it, it's just, I think, a first step in um, in really coming to terms with some of the, uh, the things that um, we we maybe have to do uh, to to try and protect our planet more. And if we really appreciate our planet, then it's not a task. It's not, oh, I have to drive less or I have to plant native plants or whatever, you know, whatever it is. It's not, it's not a burden anymore. It's like, wow, I really want to do this for our right. amazing planet. You know, it's a whole different, a different mindset. So um, you know, kids have a natural sense of wonder. They just innately connect with the planet. And um, and so it was really fun, actually, to write, uh, write a kid's book. And what was your inspiration that really motivated you to want to write this children's book? Well, it was, um, it was appreciation and just um, realizing how how magic our planet is. So the book, the two planets, um, there's a planet called Retha, which is Earth all mixed up. Um, mm -hmm. And things don't work on that planet. I, I, I was thinking, well, what if we lived on a planet where the wind didn't blow by itself or water didn't flow to the river, the, the rivers and, and the, uh, the oceans by itself? And what if leaves didn't make uh, nutrients for for more plants or what if plants didn't grow their own pollen all of these things that our planet just does for us right. um, you know we don't think about it and if we don't think about it then we don't really appreciate it and so really the inspiration was just awe for like my personal awe for the planet and appreciation of, uh, of the beauty and the interconnectedness like the we think of it as all these separate parts, or at least I guess that's the science mind, right? We yeah. we like to sort of compartmentalize things and analyze them and figure them out. But um, just because we think of it as separate parts, it doesn't mean it is. It's one whole interconnected thing. And, um, and so the book just talks about how things are all interconnected, like in a kind of a straightforward way. And also how how even though um, these little aliens are called wooshidus, which is a word I I got from my youngest son. He used to talk mm -hmm. about aliens, and he said wooshidus, and I said what what's a wooshidu? And he goes, oh, you know the aliens. And I go, okay, that's so awesome. So the yeah. wooshidus, <laughs> the wooshidus on Retha, um, even though they have to do all of these things to keep their planet working and to make it habitable. Uh, they love 
their planet. They really appreciate it. And um, when they read about Earth, uh, the magic planet, they laugh because they don't believe it's real. Nothing that magic could possibly be real. I love that. I love that. You know, it, it is, it is, you know, I think we take for granted, you know, our planet. We were talking about this earlier, but, you know, our, it there it is a magical place, you know, because when you think about it, there's everything that it has been created on, on planet Earth, you know, is here for a reason. And if we didn't have one thing, something else couldn't function properly. And it, we really need everything in order to function as a whole whole planet, you know, and to keep the animals alive, to keep the people alive. And, and you know, it, it, it's something that, you know, I think it's important that people understand is that, you know, we really, in order to keep everything healthy, we really need to take care of our planet. And, you know, for years, we, we haven't really, you know, care for our planet as, as well as we should, you know, for you being a civil engineer and being on, in the area focusing on water, you know, what have you seen, you know, and some of those changes, you know, with the environment, you know, from, from where it was and, and how it is now? Yeah, <clears throat> well, part of the problem is we think of ourselves as separate, you know, from the planet, we're actually part of it. And um, so a lot of my work is in urban areas. And if you think of the, the amount of water that a tree holds, you know, if you've ever been camping <laughs> and tried mm -hmm. to burn wet wood, you know, there's a lot of water in a tree. Um, and so when we, when we change, you know, from a field or a forest to an urban area, a lot of people think of, of urban areas, urban water as being polluted. And there, you know, obviously there is pollution that runs off the streets and that kind of thing. But the other change is, is the volume. So it's not only the quality, it's the quantity of water. And um, so when you see rain running off an urban street, for example, it, most places, it, it doesn't go to a treatment anywhere. It goes right into a river or a creek. And, you know, if somebody, if somebody threw, you know, those, those big um, bags of milk, I don't know if you get, we get bags of milk in Canada. If somebody okay. threw three liters, you know, or a gallon of, of water at you and you had to catch it, you, it's very heavy, you know, it has a lot of momentum. Yes. And we think of all of that water that's going down the street, going into the sewer and storm sewer and, and into a creek, it just blows out the you know the the walls of the creek and the the fish and the other animals the 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 bugs that live in a creek it they they evolve with a certain um velocity the certain speed of the water and a certain quantity of water and right. a storm will change all of that in an urban area so and it's warmer uh you know if a street is in the summer certainly is is warm and um, you know, we don't have uh, trout and that kind of thing, you know, rainbow trout, for example, in, in urban streams. And a lot of people assume it's because of pollution, but it's actually temperature. They need cooler water. So yeah. even if the temperature, even if the, the water is fairly clean, they just can't survive in, in an urban environment because uh, the, the water is too warm. <clears throat> They're cool or cold water fish. So so we, you know, by changing, just taking out a few trees fundamentally changes how rivers um, respond and, and what creatures can live in the rivers. You know, I never thought of that. You know, that's, you're so right. Like I would always, when I would see nowadays, especially where I live in New Jersey, um, you're always seeing reconstruction reconstru work done. They're always knocking down trees. They're always trying to, you know, buy up properties and build houses or build shopping centers, blah, 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 blah. And it would make me so upset because I would see them take down such beautiful trees, you know, and, and, you know, but I never thought of the concept of, let's say there is a stream or there is a water in that area and you do take out those trees, which are, which are making it cooler water. You know, if you take the trees out, then you're going to have warm water. And a lot of those fish that lived in that area are no longer going to be able to survive. And I never thought of it like that, but that makes so much sense. And it, it shows you how, you know, how serious it is when, when we knock down trees and when we take, you know, you know, the, the, the trees away from our environment. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not only warmer, there's more of it. There's more water to run off and, and that volume makes a big difference. So, um, and you know, we don't think really of, of urban areas having sort of natural streams because a lot of it is underground. It's sewer systems, right. <clears throat> sewer systems, but no matter where you are on the planet, you're connected to an ocean by water. So whatever mm -hmm. runs off your property, whether you know it's a it's a balcony, or you know you have a big lot, or you're a farm, um, that water if it stays as if it doesn't evaporate or you know go into the soil or be taken up by a tree, um, it eventually reaches an ocean. You you know, and that's why it's so important. Uh, you know, cosmetic pesticides for a green lawn. You know, it's just yeah. such a bad idea. I, I know people love their green lawns, but um, in native plants, they're, they hold more water. They support the insects, which support the birds. Um, you know, generally, they're, they can be prettier <laughs> flowers. Mm -hmm. Depends on your, your taste, I guess. But, you know, little things like that, like what you do on your your own property, even if it's, you know, putting some flowers on in a basket on a, a balcony, it comes like, they capture water um, right. and they, they encourage plant growth, which is, you know, we need our pollinators, we need our bugs. Um, and so, you know, what people do in their own space ultimately is part of, of the oceans, you know, no matter how far away you are, uh, I'm yeah. landlocked, you know, <laughs> I don't, there's no ocean close to me, but um, I'm always thinking about, what you know and and plastics and that kind of thing like just littering and uh you know if i see a plastic floating down a river i think oh my goodness that could end up from my where i am up in the atlantic ocean right well you know even if, if the the plastic is heated there are so many toxins that come out of that that piece of plastic and if it's in the water and and you have the sun rain, rain on the on the on the plastic in the water it's going to contaminate the water and bring toxins into the water as well and we already have a big problem where you know in the, in the united states they did a study and a lot of the bottled waters that they tested, which were really well-known names um, that were supposed to be quote unquote pure water and purified water had toxins in them. Even the best ones that were highly rated still had toxins in them. So, you know, it, it shows, you know, how, how, you know, how us not taking care of, of our planet, you know, affects, you know, and then, you know, affects us as, as a whole. And how it actually, you know, people are drinking these waters and what does it do into their bodies, you know, and if they drink those waters in those bottles for a long period of time, what is it going to do in the long run? You know, people don't think about these things. So it's hurting animals, you know, and, and it's and it's hurting human beings at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And those plastics, um, you know, whether it's a bottle or a film of some kind, you know, a wrapper, um, they break up into smaller pieces. Uh, you know, with wind and erosion, or they hit rocks as they they sort of flow down the stream. Uh, and they, the smaller they become, they some plastics actually attract chemicals so that um, when they're ingested by, you know, a fish or whatever, even if they're small, they're carrying a toxic load that you wouldn't expect. It's not just from the plastic, it's from other contaminants in the water that can adhere to the, uh, the plastic. So right. uh, it's it's kind of a double whammy in terms of you know, ingesting a plastic, but then also ingesting some uh, uh, some contaminants that that attach onto that, um, that plastic. And right. you know, we've been washing synthetic since the 1960s, you know, polyesters are basically yeah. plastic. And um, all the little fibers, they don't get treated. You know, <clears throat> we treat wastewater. Yeah. Uh, most cities, yeah, almost all cities in North America anyway, have wastewater treatment plants, but they're not designed to remove those microscopic, you know, fibers, plastic fibers. They end up, some of them are removed, but then, you know, they end up in the biosolids or the, the solid materials. Like every plastic goes somewhere. There's no... Yeah. There's no place such as a way, you know, you can't throw plastics away. There is no way. It ends up somewhere and it stays for 
for years and years and years. Wow. Um, yeah, it's it's chemically stable, which is, I guess, uh, a double-edged sword, right? <laughs> you yeah. want something stable, but you don't want it to last, be around like a thousand years from now. Right, 100%. Now, with your book, like, do, do do children understand, like, because you said you, it's actually, you know, it was meant for a certain age group, but there is a very, uh, you know, a large age group that really is enjoying this book from very young to, you know, to the, to the tweens is actually, you know, like they, <laughs> they seem to draw really well to the book and, you know, and, and even if the children are young, they are attracted by the illustrations and they ask questions and then you could read the book and explain to the children, you know, and help them learn about the environment also. And, um, you know, and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And when you, when you wrote the book, um, you know, have you seen like, what type of responses have you seen from these children or questions that they were, they're bringing over to you? Yeah. So yeah, I've read the book um, a number of times in, in school, school classes, uh, well, and to, you know, a, a few little kids in my life, but um, in the classes, like the the target age uh, is kind of four to eight range. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they, they really, any younger, they like the pictures, but they kind of move around quite a bit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they love the pictures. Um, the target group, they, um, they listen very intently to you know, how the other planet works and then what our planet has. And uh, there's a little, there's a little alien. So the aliens, um, they're wooshy doos. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's one little alien that, um, that believes earth is a real place and finds out some of the answers to the questions in the book. And so um, that's, to that's at, at the end of the book where it's, uh, you know, what are the magic animals that, uh, that carry pollen? Uh, yes. That kind of thing. And so um, when I ask, well, what do you think the message of the book is or, or what is the book saying right away? The kids will say, oh, we're really lucky to live here or Earth is a magic place. Um, and I've I've read it. Uh, I didn't know I would be reading it, but I read it in one um, school to a, an older group, a grade five, six group. Uh, which made me a little bit nervous because you know, I thought, oh, my goodness, these kids are going to be you know, kind of bored, but they also loved it. And, um, and one of the girls said to me, I never thought of earth as magic. I wish I had thought of it as magic before this. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. But they, they were also interested in talking about, um, you know, water and a career, like, like, you know, just my career as, uh, as an engineer and uh, consultant. So, you know, it was, they, they moved from the book into, um, you know, what the, a project they've been doing on water uh, recently. So, so it transitioned nicely, but they listened to, they, they were not bored at all when I read the book. So that was, that was a very pleasant surprise. You know, it's amazing, but, you know, children draw to these things and so do adults, you know, like there are many times you, you know, I, I know many of my friends that who listen to documentaries and, and they listen to, you know, um, stories that, that talk about the, the planet and, and they talk about the earth and the water is a remarkable place, you know, it, the, you know, the ocean, the rivers, the creeks, you know, the, the lakes and, um, you know, there's so many, there's so many creatures that live in the water, you know, and and, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's just an, it's an amazing, amazing place. And, um, you know, we really have to really figure out ways that we can actually, you know, focus on, on keeping it, you know, in good condition so we can, you know, live a, a healthy and structured life. And, the, and these animals will have a place to live also, because, you know, if we, if we continue to abuse, you know, our waters, you know, in the long run, you know, everyone is going to suffer you know? Yeah, we're mostly water. I think we are also water. Right. Um, and the, the thing is, I mean, water, water is beautiful. Um, beauty is healing. You know, it's, um, it's restorative, you know, if, if, uh, and this is from personal, my personal experiences, feeling um, kind of overwhelmed sometimes with uh, all of the problems that we're dealing with. Um, just taking 
just taking time to appreciate beauty and it can be anywhere you can be anywhere and find it you know look yeah. at the sky or what I mean different people find find beauty in different places but I think if we if we do that if we learn to restore you know people working in the environment people who are concerned about it yeah. uh, if we can rely on it to also restore us and it's amazing, really. I'm not sure how it works scientifically, um, and I don't really have to know that. I just know that um, it re-energizes you, the beauty and, and well, gratitude, as you know, you've written about also that there's something restorative about gratitude and awe as well. And uh, and kids have that naturally. Like, they're everything's amazing, you know, everything. They can just see it, and, and that helps parents, I think, connect or reconnect uh, right. to the beauty. And once, you know, once you're restored by it, then you, you're you energized again to find out more about it, what you can do. Um, you know, it's less of a burden. It's more, you're, you're inspired in a way that uh, if you're just feeling the weight of it, you know, you're dragging your, your butt around and it, it's just, yeah. it, it, it's not sustaining. It's not sustaining yourself and it's probably not, you know, as effective for the planet either. Yeah. And I think books like yours make such an impact because, you know, it's funny, but there are things that just stick with you, you know, and information that just sticks with you. And when you hear a creative story and you hear, you know, uh, a, a really good meaning behind the story, you know, a lot of times people don't realize, but a lot of children don't forget it. You know, they they might they might not remember every single word, but the majority, the main concepts stick in their head, whether it's the illustration or the overall meaning behind the book. And maybe they remember, you know, they might remember the the name for the aliens, you know, and and it just sticks in their head, you know, and and what they learn as a child could actually play through as an adult. And I think that's what's great about your book is you're teaching them something at a young age that could actually make them change the way they live in in the future as they become young adults mm -hmm. and they can bring their parents along too that's what happened yeah. with smoking right they started with the kids and then the kids went home and said wow mom you gotta stop smoking yeah <laughs> they, they changed a lot of people's attitudes towards uh you know that was that was an issue in the past more than it is now but <clears throat> now you know that uh that that connection there there's actually um a field it's not my field of study but it's eco psychology and that connection um with with uh, just the the planet and uh there's a, a a local author um in the Ottawa Valley where um he wrote a book about eco psychology and he used to bring kids camping and you know just to connect and he was finding that they would do that they'd go home very um enthusiastic and and not have their parents understand what they were talking about. So we started taking whole families out and saying, you know, and then so that it could be uh, an integrated experience for the kids, not just uh, something where it was, it was almost like a conflict for them. You know, they, they got yeah. it in, uh, in the, the experience in when they were, you know, uh, in raw nature, call it, uh, right. with no no receptivity, no nowhere to to kind of latch it onto at home, yeah. um, it it worked better with the whole family. Yeah, it, I think that would definitely be a plus, and you know, because if if the whole family takes part of it, you know, they all learn together, and then they all, you know, as a parent being a mentor you want to implement these, these good habits, you know, because as, as a parent, that's what we do is we want to teach our children good things. And if you see, you know, you learn about the environment and you learn how you can care for the environment and help the environment, you know, stay clean and stay strong, you know, the parents can, you know, be the mentors and, and, you know, implement it. And that's also, I think, builds a common bond between the parent and, and the child is that they're both working towards one common goal. And I don't think people realize, but 
things as simple as your book could actually help a relationship between two a child and their and their um and their parent even grow closer because they are doing a little project together where they're learning about the environment they're learning ways they could actually help the environment and then they're working together towards one common goal which is very i think very um beneficial and and it could actually make a family and a relationship stronger i think mm -hmm. Yeah, and the parents can take the cue from the kid, too. Like, if the kid wants to talk about, you know, the environment or the planet, then that's great. Some kids will also want to talk about the imaginary world and let their imagination run. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that's fun, too, because they can take ownership for what they imagine uh, the planet to be. Like, the, the book covers some of it, but then they're allowed to they have free reign uh, yeah. you know, to imagine two suns or three moons or, you know, other things that might not work and how they may yeah. fix it. Uh, so, uh, you know, and kids, I guess we all learn from our imagination and we create from our imagination. So, yeah. uh, you know, and then usually your kids, if they like a book, they want to hear it more than once and different, different uh, readings, you know, you can kind of, uh, take it wherever the kid wants to to take it and, uh, yeah. and everybody has fun and, and learn as well obviously but uh, also have fun with it yeah you know I remember when my son was young he loved dinosaurs when he was a child and so I used to read him stories about dinosaurs and then I would create I would extend the story and I would go on and then you know I I had, had convinced him through through my own story that we had dinosaurs living in our backyard and he thought they were behind the bushes and the trees and at night he would run to the window trying to see if he could see them and it was the cutest thing you know so it it's it's fun and because you're you're also you're encouraging your child to use their imagination even more because you know I would go on and I would tell you know I would tell the second half of the book that it wasn't even existent you know and then all of a sudden he's running out the door he has this you know thing that oh my god there's dinosaurs in our backyard you know and he was all excited and he wanted to try to see if he could see one you know so it, it, it could be a lot of fun and and it shows your children how to use their imagination and you know and that's how you get children to actually when they go into their careers they some of them are very career based and and, and they are very creative and they go into careers based on creativity and you could spur that creativity as a child. And storytelling is a great way to enhance a child's creativity. Yes. Yeah, it really is. Like this is a, it's a short book. Um, when my, I have two sons and when they were uh, a little bit older than, you know, sort of older than eight or 10, we started reading chapter books. And every once in a while, one of the chapter books would, there would be a movie and they would be really mad if the movie ruined <laughs> their image you know they had this whole world in their heads yeah and there was a few movies they were quite angry that uh that they didn't do it right <laughs> right well, I always felt like when I read books I always felt like the books were better than the actual movie when they tried to make the movie I always seemed like the characters were not exactly the way I implemented them in my head or you know or they took you know they missed a lot of the great what I thought were the great parts because you knew the if you read the whole book you know exactly what's supposed to be in the movie you're like well they're missing this part they're they didn't they didn't do this they didn't do this you know so I feel like a book always is much better than the actual movie. I, it could never, it can never be as detailed. It can never be, you know, as as good as the movie. And and you create your own characters from from the descriptions in the books. So I I always feel like the books are are a much better um, thing than the actual movie itself. It's easy, just like you know, to 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 listen to a movie than to read a book. But there's so much more when you read, you know. Yeah. You get a lot more, I think, from it. Yeah, and when you read bedtime stories, I would still be reading bedtime stories to my sons. If they were that. <laughs> Obviously, they want their adult men, but um, you know, they're they they're also uh, avid readers. You know, from from reading right from a very young age, and it it just makes it so much easier to learn. Like when you like to read, and when you're yeah. curious about what may be in this book or that book. Um, it just makes, I don't know, it's just enriches your life. There's, there's so many options out there to read, you know, and as you, as you age out of the kids books, um, yeah. 
you know, and, but you're still in school. It's just, uh, it's such a, a, I don't know, a, not essential, but really, really um, enriching uh, yeah. skill to have uh, an interest in books, I think. Oh, definitely. And I, I even feel that when you read books, it also enhances your communication skills because there are many times when I would have to speak in front of people and I could just stop after, you know, teaching something and go into a story and, you know, just have, you know, the beginning of the story in my head. And then I could just tell a story and then go back to what I was doing. And that would enhance and that would, would keep them, you know, engaged in what I had to say, you know, but storytelling is really what keeps people engaged. And, and the greatest thing is that if you could relate something from a story to your own personal life, it make you, you automatically have a, a, a deep interest in that book or a deep interest in what you're learning, because you know, all you need is one little thing that you could relate to. And then it makes it just it just pulls you right in. Yeah, yeah, it unfolds a whole aspect. I mean, we are, we have a long, long history of storytelling, right? It predates writing, even. And uh, we there's something, something about stories and songs. I mean, I, I would sing, but I can't. <laughs> so I had to write, <laughs> I had to write a kid's book, because that's another way that I think um, is really, fun to connect with kids is you know through music songs little rhymes oh, clean yeah. up songs and that kind of thing right where yeah they, they don't want to clean up but they want to sing the song so they'll, they'll right yeah. well don't feel bad because it, when I used to try to sing my kids used to put their hand over my mouth so it basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have that experience in common then <laughs> well no. know your limits yes know your limits exactly exactly <laughs> if people wanted to purchase your book um show your book to everybody where can they find your book um so it's on it is on amazon i have uh, a tale of two planets.com uh so two t-w-o a tale of two planets the the uh the title um freezing press it's it's published by Friesen Press, um, F-R-E-I-S-E-N Press. Um, so yeah, a few places. I'm on Instagram uh, at Mary Trudeau Books. Um, I have a my company professional website, which I'm sure will bore people. So I won't mention that for my consulting. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So yeah. Probably a tale of two planets.com, Amazon. Um, I, there's a, a few independent bookstores that have it as well, but that's more a local to where, where I live. So it wouldn't be in New Jersey in a local store. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's on Amazon, people can find it all over the world. So that's a great thing. And yeah. if, if you had to take today and you want to emphasize on some important factors, what would be some things you'd like to emphasize to the listeners today from our conversation? Uh, first of all, enjoy our planet. Like really, it's so restorative. Beauty is restorative wherever you find that. Um, what you do in your backyard or in your space uh, makes a difference. It's con connected. We're all connected globally. Um, and so, uh, you know, reducing chemical use, planting native plants, um, you know, something that pollinators or birdhouse, something like that. Like always know that um, you can make a difference in your own space and that cumulatively we will, as we, we all connect, um, understanding our our that that interconnection and that effect um will gradually make a, make a difference and turn things around yes yeah very true so true now do you think in the future i know you're not planning it right now but do you think you might do a second book in the future i would yes actually um that's an aspirational goal at this point it might have something to do with water we'll have to see <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share before we go? Uh, no, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Stacey. Thanks for the opportunity. 
Oh, you're very welcome. This has been a pleasure. I'm so glad you came on the show. I really enjoyed all the information you provided. I love the fact that you wrote this children's book. I love how you're educating children. I love how children are grasped into it and really taking an interest in the environment. And they're doing that through your stories. They're doing that through your illustrations. And, you know, you're really bringing awareness to the to the younger generation, which is, you know, the people who are going to make a difference in our world, you know, in, in a short period of time. So, you know, thank you so much for, for doing that, because it, it is a very big deal. You know, stories like yours can change, you know, help change the world itself. And like you said, the planet is a magical place. And by educating people, we can keep it magical, you know, and that's the whole, the whole point is to keep the, the planet magical and to really, and that only way to do that is to learn how to care for it and bring awareness. And that's what your book is. It's bringing awareness. It's fun. It has a great story. And, you know, I thank you so much for, for taking the time to create it. Thank you. No, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, you have a great day and it was a pleasure having you on. And I hope maybe in the future we'll have you on again. I hope so. That would be great. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Bye. You have a great day. Thanks. Bye.